respected teachers and my dear friends. So first, let me thank the Madhya Kerala Orthopedic Club for inviting me for this uh, talk. And uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to be in my hometown and uh, that to as a speaker in this uh, conference. And also, I would like to congratulate the Madhya Kerala Orthopedic Club for uh, taking this uh, bold decision to uh, start this uh, CME, the basic shoulder CME. So every week, if you see, uh, one or two shoulder CMC, CMEs are happening in the country, and especially in Kerala also, uh, different C shoulder CMC, CMEs. Some five years back, the knee was the hot topic. Now shoulder has become the hot topic, and most of the clubs are conducting shoulder CMEs. But the problem is that most of them are of advanced nature, like how you do a irreparable rotator cuff or how you do a reverse bank art or a failed bank art. So no one is uh, taken pain to uh, start or conduct a basic CME. So I am sure that the organizers have taken a bold step and definitely the youngsters and all those who are interested in starting this older CME will definitely benefit out of this CME. So my topic is so arthroscopic anatomy of the shoulder. The anatomy is same in uh, whichever position. If you are in the, the, the patient is in the standing position or in the lying down position or the supine or the prone position. So if you are doing an arthroscopy or an open surgery, so the anatomy is the same. And also in shoulder CME is the beach chair position of the lateral decubitus position. Or the, so if you are looking to the anterior portal or the posterior portal, the anatomy is the same, but the orientation is different. So that depends on from where you look and where you see the structures inside. So the anatomy, it can be the, the gross anatomy or the arthroscopic anatomy. You're all familiar with from your first MBBS days and from the various cadaveric workshops, you may be seeing the anatomy of the shoulder. But when it comes to the arthroscopic anatomy, so is there any difference? That is what we are going to see in this 15 minutes talk. So this is the surface anatomy. So you all know how to uh, draw the shoulder uh, surface anatomy. So you palpate the inferior border of, of the clavicle, the acromion, and the spine. And those things will be uh, dealt in detail by the, the coming uh, speakers. So my topic is the arthroscopic anatomy. Then that will be dealt with in the 10-point anatomy review. So here, the position of the scope is important. So anatomical structures, from where you are seeing these structures. So. So this uh, system is developed by the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. Actually, it is a 15-point system. So the 10-point system is from the posterior portal at the 5-point from the anterior portal. I am not uh, going into the um, post anterior view because the same structures are again repeated. But the only thing is the orientation is different. So the 10-point system is from the posterior portal. So these positions, so in each position, you are seeing certain things, certain anatomical structures in a different way. So the purpose of this evaluation is to perform a uniform, comprehensive evaluation of all the anatomical structures in the shoulder. The first position is the, uh, so you are seeing the biceps tendon and the superior labrum. So when you introduce the scope through the posterior portal, the first structure you see is the biceps tendon. From our initial days, if you are seeing the biceps tendon alone, we were, we were very happy. But this is the first uh, thing that you need to see in the, that is the mark. So the carefully first you evaluate the long head of biceps tendon and uh, see the anterior and posterior structures of the intra-articular segment of the biceps tendon. And sometimes you may see this type of synovial covering of the tendon that is the delicate vascular structure that is called the vinculae. And then you pull and push, the, probe the tendon uh, to see any, uh, any fraying or any detachment is there and see the uh, pulleys on the exit of the groove. So you can see the anterior and posterior pulleys of the biceps tendon when you pull the tendons. And vinculi biceps are the strands of synovium as I, I already mentioned. And sometimes the biceps tendon may be completely or partially encased by capsule and synovial tissue and you may, be, may not be able to see the biceps tendon at all. So you may think that the biceps tendon is absent, but this is covered by the synovium that is this, and that you should know that it is an anatomical, uh, normal anatomical thing only. Sometimes you can see a bifid biceps tendon. 
this is also an anatomical variant how you uh, find out it is you prompt the, these two brands uh, two bands and there won't be any any uh, fraying or any bleeding in between these two tendons so this is also anatomical sometimes the biceps tendon can get dual attachment so usually it is attached to the superior glenotubercle and the labrum and one band uh, apart from that it, one brand can go into the rotator cuff tendon or sometimes the whole tendon can go into the rotator cuff cable so there won't be any attachment at the superior glenotubercle so these are all the anatomical variants and then coming to the root of the biceps tendon so next the anchor point of the biceps tubercle is usually located 5 mm medial to the edge of the glenoid so here also you give traction and see whether there is any, any pathological uh, detachment is there or not. But normally the, uh, the anchor is, the root is firmly attached to the supraglenoid area. But in all, as all age advances, there may be some loosening and that should not be confused with the pathological change. So next part in the first position. The first position is the biceps tendon and the superior labrum. The next part is the superior labrum. So this is the attachment of the free edge of the normal labrum. In that is variable depending on patient's age. So in young patients, it is intimately attached, but as age advances, there is there is there can be a cleft in between the superior labrum and the glenoid, and that also is normal. And coming to the second position, then you are coming back uh, from the first position to see the posterior capsule and the posterior labrum. The posterior labrum should be smooth and is usually tightly fused to the glenoid surface. The outer edge of the healthy labrum is slightly higher than the cartilage edge. So this is the posterior part of the uh, labrum and capsule. So the visualization, the posterior capsule has a deep fold uh, posterior to the labrum and this uh, area you can, uh, you may be able to see loose bodies but most of the time you may miss these loose bodies in the posterior capsule if you are not carefully looking into the posterior aspect. And sometimes you can see a patulous capsule especially in multidirectional instability. The labrum can be hyperplastic and even appear non-existent and uh, this capsule is very patulous. Coming to the third position, uh, from the superior, then the mid-posterior, then you are going, to the, going down to the third uh, lower position. Here you see three structures, the inferior labrum, the inferior axillary recess and the capsular attachment of the humeral head. So that is the, uh, the diagrammatic representation of the, in, uh, the axillary ax, uh, the recess. And uh, uh, in this area, uh, uh, entering in this area is very difficult in adhesive capsulitis. And, and first thing in this third position is the inferior labrum. You carefully look the inferior labrum. The normal inferior labrum is smoothly fused with the cartilage. The capsular border of the labrum is slightly elevated a few millimeters higher than the cartilage edge. Uh, in this position, the, other, the next thing is the axillary pouch. So you rotate the scope anterior and posterior to see the inferior capsular hammock. So you, can, you, you, you all know that the inferior glenohumeral ligament is on either side, and the, it's in the anterior and the inferior bands. So see the axillary pouch. The normal, uh, normally the tissue is smooth with delicate synovial covering. Then the, you introduce the scope again down and uh, look upwards to see the attachment of the capsule at the humeral head. So this. Uh, it's a very good picture is taken from Snyder. So most of the time, so I, uh, I haven't seen such a clear picture of the inferior attachment of the capsule into the humeral head. That's a very good picture, I think. Um, and sometimes there may be small normal fenestrations near the attachment of the to the head. Next, uh, the fourth position. So first superior, then the middle area, then coming down to the third position, and then you are going again up upwards. But you are seeing the glenoid part in the fourth position. So the glenoid articular surface, so normally the glenoid articular surface is covered by very good cartilage. The, the cartilage only you can see, but there are some variations, the, the anatomical variations. One is a thin area at the center. This is a thin spot at the center of the inferior half of the glenoid that is normal only. And another thing is the anterior glenoid edge notch. So this is in the anterior part. The indentation or dimple along the anterior edge of the glenoid that demarcates the superior two-fifth from the inferior three-fifth of the glenoid. This is also normal. This is also anatomical uh, variant. And sometimes in the superior part, the cartilage may be thinner. That also related to the aging. 
So these are the anatomical variations in the fourth position, a glenoid pattern. Coming to the fifth position, so again you are going to the uh, superior part. So here you are um, seeing the uh, supraspinate, the insertion of the supraspinate tendon and its attachment and the articular surface of the supraspinate tendon. So here comes the rotator cuff cable. The rotator cuff tendon is covered on the articular surface with a layer of capsule and synovium. The thickening in the capsular tissue present on the under surface of the cuff that is oriented perpendicular to the biceps tendon. So you can see in the picture, so the capsular attachment perpendicular to the biceps tendon alone is called the rotator cuff ridge or the rotator cuff cable. The next is you are uh, going again back at the superior portion from the insertion of the supraspinatus, you are going back to the insertion of the infraspinatus and the teres minor. This uh, area uh, frequently appears fenestrated with the openings in the superficial layers for the vascularity of the humeral head. So these are the fenestrations that you, you can see and uh, the bare area is located adjacent to the infraspinatus attachment uh, to the humeral head and may have multiple blood vessel channels and this area is devoid of articular cartilage. Coming to the seventh position, so the, uh, the remaining part of the articular cartilage, that also glistening uh, articular cartilage and uh, there is no, um, no major anatomical variations described in the uh, humeral head as in case of glenoid. The only things you should see any pathological fraying or a chondral loss or those things, those are all pathological uh, things that will come in diagnostic arthroscopy by, by the other speakers. So uh, in, uh, in seventh position you see the articular cartilage of the humeral head, that's all. Coming to the eighth position, so that is an important area. So uh, here you need to see all these four structures. One is the anterior superior labrum. It is not the superior labrum, the superior part of the anterior labrum. The superior part, the labrum you have already covered along with the biceps tendon in, in the first position. In the eighth position, you come, uh, you can see in the small picture, the eighth position, you see the anterior superior labrum, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the superior edge of the subscapularis tendon and the MGHL. So we will uh, take one by one, the anterior superior labrum. So the anterior superior labrum as a, uh, so the all the aging is a big thing, so you can confuse it with patholo pathological changes. The in, this is the anterior superior labrum, uh, the, the cleft is normal with aging and probe that area to see any pathological changes in the anterior superior labrum. Then this is the sublabral foramen. So sometimes the labrum is detached in the superior part uh, showing a sublabral foramen that is also normal. And the third thing is the Beaufort complex or the Beaufort complex. So here the complex has got three uh, things. One is that the, the MGHL is thick and cord like. Second, the MGHL is attached to the superior labrum just anterior at the base of the biceps anchor. And there is no label tissue on the antero superior glenoid. These three things constitute the Beaufort complex. So the synovial tuff that is also normal. So this is the, uh, the synovium, the fraying of the synovium at the anterior glenoid notch. So this is normal only. Coming to the second part in this position, after the superior glenohumeral ligament, then the subscapularis te uh, tendon, the and anterior superior labrum, then the subscapularis tendon. Here this is the subscapularis tendon. You probe the subscapularis tendon in the intraarticular part up to the insertion at the lesser tuberosity. And sometimes you may be you may see these bifid subscapularis that is a dual insertion at the, that went to the lesser uh, tuberosity load but you can see uh, two bands uh, sometimes you may mistake with some uh, torn tendon. Coming to the third uh, anatomical structure in this person that is a superior glenohumeral ligament. This uh, superior glenohumeral ligament that originate from the supraglenoid tubercle is almost at the uh, origin of the biceps tendon. Um, that is just anterior to the long head of the biceps tendon attachment and it is inserted into the fovea capitis in line, uh, uh, in line superior to the lesser tuberosity of the bicepital sulcus. And some books say that this is uh, attached in continuation with the superior part of the, less, uh, the subscapularis tendon. So you can simply uh, remember that it starts, uh, uh, superior glenohumeral ligament starts from the, uh, the origin of the biceps and inserted into the area of the subscapularis. 
So uh, if you look carefully, you can see in almost all the shoulders, the superior glenohumeral ligament, but most of the time, this is not, uh, the surgically is not that important, so we may miss uh, looking at the, we may omit looking at the superior glenohumeral ligament. And this is the, the anatomical and the schematic representation of this superior glenohumeral ligament. Then comes the middle glenohumeral ligament. This is the most variable appearance of all the anterior shoulder ligaments. In the usual situation, it appears as a fold or thickening in the anterior capsule that crosses the subscapularis tendon at 45 degrees. So these are the variations in the, the middle glenohumeral ligament. So uh, the, in the pictures, number one marked is the glenohumeral ligament and two is the subscapularis tendon. Uh, sometimes it's a cord-like thing and sometimes leaf-like and so different uh, names and uh, depending on the thickness of the glenohumeral ligament is described. Uh, these are the uh, different uh, names, the thick sheet like, thin like, thin or it may be completely absent. These are the anatomical variations. Coming to the ninth position, that is in the anterior inferior labrum. So from the, you know, the superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, subscapularis tendon and the anterior superior labrum in, and you are coming to the ninth position, that is antero inferior labrum. There are two normal patterns. Approximately 95% of cases, the labrum has a smooth attachment to the glenoid cartilage. And sometimes it may be meniscoid. There is an article, the edge of the labrum is separated from the glenoid cartilage. Next is the, tender, this is the last position. It includes the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the anteroinferior capsule. The inferior glenohumeral ligament, as you all know, it has got two parts in the anterior and the inferior part forming the hammock of the inferior part of the articular uh, cartilage. If the ligaments are overly loose, it is, you can um, go into the, the area that is called the drive-through side. And if it is tight, then adhesive capsulitis, and it will be very difficult to enter that area. And you need to release the inferior capsule and the IGHL uh, to, uh, if you are uh, doing a uh, decompression or a, uh, arthrolysis in, in adhesive capsulitis. So the anterior capsule are ligaments inserted into the labrum and are firmly attached with it to the neck of the glenoid. So this comes the end of ten po po the ten positions at the, at the uh, uh, shoulder arthroscopic anatomy. And thank you all for patient listening.